and um, good afternoon everyone. I'm really, really happy and excited to be presenting this today. Um, this is uh, the very, very early stages of my postdoctoral project that I started only three or four months ago and that kind of got slowed down a bit because of personal reason, like a, a mini Merc medieval, hopefully, person that's going to come <laughs> at some point. But as a result, half of the fieldwork I was supposed and hopefully present the result of today didn't happen. So I thought that instead of doing this, I'm going to take a step back, think about and discuss a little bit about the big ideas that are behind uh, the, the project that uh, I am starting to work on at the moment. So as uh, the title says, my project is looking at the the transformation of places of devotion in early medieval northwestern Europe. And when I say northwestern Europe, I'm really looking at the kind of edges, what was kind of beyond the Roman, uh, Roman Empire that has a different narrative of what is happening in the post-Roman Europe. So for today's presentation, I'm first of all going to discuss a little bit these different processes of Christianization in both post-Roman post -Roman Europe, but also beyond uh, the role of the elites in this uh, Christianization of the landscape, the role of car stones through that, because this is what my research is built on. I did a, a PhD on comparing the use of car stones in the landscape in Scandinavia, Scotland, and Ireland. And that's my reason for being here today, because, you know, comparisons. And that's cool. And then uh, the proce pro process of centralization of places, of ritual and burial places and assembly places. And then looking at the Northwest uh, in particular, the question of the very narrative and varied scholarships that we have access to and what their differences and similarities can help or sometime uh, render maybe a bit difficult this whole process of comparison. Uh, looking at the methodological challenges a little bit and then addressing the question of, you know, the challenge of the box, thinking in the box, outside the box or without a box or whatever. So very briefly, the, the process of Christianization in post-Roman Europe uh, as a contrast, uh, kind of doing a little bit of a disclaimer here, I'm, I'm kind of keeping the, those term generals. We know that there's a lot more, uh, uh, um, uh, a lot more complexities that are going into that, of course. But looking at the, the, the wide narrative, there are some recogniz recognizable patterns uh, in post-Roman Europe and uh, mostly in kind of continental post-Roman Europe. Uh, it's quite well documented. It's very widely researched and understood. And whether you work in, in France or Italy or, or, or Germany, you can, you can find archaeologically uh, and sometimes through written sources similarities that help understand that this process of post-Roman and establishment of, of uh, new Christian uh, cult centers and, and a place of ritual. Um, there's also some very big physical processes happening, especially between the 9th and 12th centuries, such as the formation of towns and villages densification of a nu nucleation of population that uh, has been referred to as incastellamento, but also the process of centralization around churches or ecclesiastical centers that are that is called in um, and also uh, as with churches also assembly places and burial places etc but when we look at beyond so that's why i put you know you have the the, the nice map of the roman empire the way we know it uh, in the second and third century, and then the beyond, and it's usually kind of cut by the map because that's not really what we're looking at. I couldn't really cut England with my cir circle, but let's imagine that I'm really looking at the, the beyond here. And when we look at these regions, especially during this, this time period between roughly the 5th to the 12th century, we have a wide range of, of evidence, whether it is archaeological evidence or written sources or complete lack thereof uh, as well. Mm -hmm. For people who work uh, in Scotland, as there's many today, uh, we know what we're talking about here, or not especially lack, but complexity of. And there's not really a marked centralization of dense, or, uh, dense population, village or town between the 11th or 12th century, especially in, in Scotland and, and um, uh, some part of Scandinavia, uh, apart from exceptions. Uh, what about in Ecclesiamento, this recentering around uh, ecclesiastical centers and, and churches? And so the kind of big question that's underlying all of this is while all these differences are happening all over the places in, in this northwestern edge, um, can we say that there are, there's this similarly big processes at work that we can see and observe in the post-Roman um, uh, 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 rest of Europe, if you want, if you wish. Um, 
So interestingly, and that was what my research has been building up uh, uh, so far, and that was kind of the thread I used for my PhD, is there's, there's one element that we can find in a lot of different areas of Northwestern uh, uh, Europe, and more specifically, specifically in Ireland, uh, Britain, Scandinavia, some occurrences in Brittany and a few in East of Europe during the early medieval period, it is the use of karstones stones in the landscape, and they are really much uh, invested in this, in this uh, Christianization of place. And elite seems to be using these as investment to demonstrate uh, uh, either spiritual or religious power in the landscape, uh, but also to, de to demarcate their land or to show that they are uh, uh, as, as object of commemoration or uh, to record the um, gift of land to the church, etc., etc. And these are quite uh, both locally and now uh, more inter-regionally uh, well attested, well studied uh, in many regions. And um, one of the, the main elements when I was doing my, my PhD research, uh, one of the main elements that I kind of drew from that is that by comparing them, even though we are looking at different type of monuments, which I'm very well aware of, but the, the way they inform each other, the way we can use uh, the different sources and their different location and their different use inform the other and help really uh, understand uh, uh, the use of these stones. And that was really something important. And so the three main themes that I was looking at, looking at the use of stones in these three different areas. So again, uh, Ireland, mostly uh, Ulster. Um, so the north of Ireland, which is uh, 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 not the one that has the most stones, uh, really. Uh, then uh, Scotland, especially the, the kind of southern Pictland, uh, um, and Sweden, mostly Upland. It's that the three themes were, you know, movement as uh, making uh, placemakers, movement, uh, monument creating places, monument creating movement, because they are indicating a lot of uh, uh, movement in the landscape, uh, whether they are connected to the same individual over long distances, or they are referring to another place or uh, we can recognize the, the school, a specific school of sculpture uh, across the landscape. Um, monuments uh, uh, also as objects of uh, uh, commemoration and, uh, uh, um, uh, and identity as well. And so these main three themes were, were really kind of uh, giving a lot of answers regarding this kind of overall use. And the one that I'm really focusing on now for the postdoc is really monuments making places and how they are uh, participating in these different uh, 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 stages of this process of Christianization. And one of the results that uh, I received was that, um, um, that I extracted and that I need now to test further in, in the postdoc is that uh, the, the monuments in certain regions seems really to pertain to different phases of the Christianization process. Some are definitely linked more to uh, uh, secular elites marking either the boundaries of their estate or the center of it, or sometimes both, uh, marking um, the, the, um, the location of a burial place or assembly place. And the further the church is institutionalized, the, the further the church becomes uh, 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 one of this main institution, the, the closer to churches and to ecclesiastical center the stones are. And uh, I just thought, okay, that's, that's why quite lucky. I was looking at about I don't know, 75, 80 uh, monuments, about 50 sites across uh, this uh, geographical area. And this kind of observation worked all through that. Okay, maybe it was a lot of luck. That is not impossible, but that is why now I want to really uh, uh, test this further. So looking at uh, how uh, uh, stones are used in the landscape, uh, we know that uh, they are really uh, used as, as a demonstration of power, but also legitimation of power, ownership by elites, uh, both secular and religious, uh, in the landscape. Here, the example of Abelemno in Scotland, uh, where the stones are situated uh, uh, quite close to a, a, a major Iron Age hill fort that might or might not be still in use at the same period. Uh, there's more research that's being currently done uh, at the moment on uh, these hill forts uh, of the area. So until recently thought that were abandoned after the end of the, 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 the late Iron Age, but maybe not. Um, uh, they are sometimes also used to de demarcate the land, uh, commemorate and even delineate ecclesiastical landscape, as here you have the example of Cardona and, and Ireland in the uh, Inishowen Peninsula. And uh, in Sweden, for instance, here the case of uh, the stones connected to 
uh, Estrid, who is a, a very important woman in the 11th century in the reg region of Tebi and Valentuna, north of Stockholm. And in all these examples and short examples that I'm showing you, uh, we're really looking at these monuments that are participating to this to this landscape of, of power and demonstration of this power and the spiritual power as well in the landscape. Um, here again, the example of these stones uh, connected to Estrid. So that's the the, the recon facial reconstruction that was done uh, by the uh, uh, museum in Stockholm. Uh, of this, of this woman, and you have here example of all the stones that are connected to her. And luckily for, for me, when I was doing the PhD, um, Sweden, uh, the case studies that I was working on in Sweden, were really providing so much clear evidence in the sense that you have everything. You have the landscape, of course, many of the stones have been moved from their original landscape, but some are still in, in or close by the original location, but you have the text on the stones that will explain to you why it's been put there, uh, uh, and by whom and for whom, and uh, uh, also the, the, the kind of way it has been carved can give us an information of when it was carved. So it's kind of ideal because you have all this information and then you start looking at the wider landscape, you start looking at how they are situated and it's like, oh, actually that's very similar to what I observed in these two other sites, which don't have all this information and things starts to, to really uh, work together. But I'll get back to that in a, in a second. So the kind of big question that my, my postdoctoral project is asking now is um, trying to bridge uh, these different phases between the very either pre-Christian or very, very early Christian uh, 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 devotional places. How is the sacred defined? And we know that this is a very wide question and can we really define it? I'm not sure that's really the, the most uh, uh, thing, but you have to ask the first question first and then see if they work or not. But um, the, there's the question of, of course, assembly places and burial places. And these assembly places where political uh, ritual are being uh, performed, but also sacral as well. So there's never a, a strong limit. Then what are the key landscape settings of these pre-Christian or very early Christian sites? Uh, and how did the process, the whole process of Christianization impact the layout uh, and spatial agency of this early sacred site? And can the notion of centralization or nucleation around churches be applied to uh, these sacred sites uh, uh, um, in throughout Northwestern Europe? <clears throat> so the case studies that I'm looking at, uh, I just started uh, yet. So Norway, uh, I'm looking at three sites in Trondelag, Rogaland and Westfold, then Scotland, as you've seen earlier, there's so much going on there, and hopefully, with all these uh, this this new research being produced, um, uh, so some some elements will be will be really enriching this research. Then Brittany uh, in France, and then the second phase, if I get the funding, will be also including uh, Ireland, uh, Sweden, Denmark, and hopefully Ireland. Man, again, we'll see how things goes, and it's really to try and and draw this narrative of the whole Northwestern Europe to see if we, we can move beyond the, the, the diversity of chronologies and, and evidence and kind of look at things in a, in, a more, um, uh, in a more universal kind of process. So the methodological comparative approach that I'm looking is, of course, uh, trying to be as systematic as possible in my analysis of the case studies selected definition of the, key, uh, of the key features and defining as well, of course, key characteristics. So that is looking at the landscapes, at the assembly places, churches, early churches, burial grounds, the topography, the crosses, the carved stones, the roads and waterways. Those are all the kind of landscape elements and, and uh, archaeological evidence. But of course, there's also looking at the historical background because that, that it's so, it, it varies so much, especially in terms of chronologies from one region to the other. And one of the elements that is also kind of key to this is trying to really uh, look at sites that are researched because a lot of very interesting sites are not well published or published in language that unfortunately I'm still not very fluent in Norwegian even though I've tried. Uh, same for Swedish. I can read, I can make my way through this, but when it's a, a whole report, uh, I, I will probably miss you know, some of the key information. So that is trying to move beyond this. Um, just going back to Sweden, uh, to kind of illustrate a little bit this question of centralization of places, you have here with the, the little stars all these, these, these sites that are linked to Estrid and to this woman who was uh, apparently a, a very uh, a strong Christian woman. Uh, possibly her tomb was found near uh, Robibro that you have just here. 
uh, and um, and really showed that uh, she was a very Christian woman. And so you have all these stones that are linked to her, which are Christian runestones as well. But by that's all in the 11th century. But by the 12th century, these places don't seem to be in, in use as much anymore. And the kind of main church center is just here at the top of the lake in Valentuna. So this is actually what I'm, I'm really trying to address, is this kind of shift in the landscape between these earlier sacred sites and then where the church, the, the, the new center, uh, or maybe continuing center in the 11th, 20th century, when it gets formalized, gets uh, established. And what's the connection? If there is one, can we bridge that gap? So, of course, there's a lot of difficulties uh, uh, that goes with this. And some of them are that uh, it happens quite a lot that the scholarly research was for a very long time. And thankfully, we're moving away from this uh, now, but it was very nationally or regionally specific. So you, you can get a lot of very interesting and important information uh, locally. But then when you're trying to cross things around, that gets a bit more complex. And then evidence seems to show, in, especially in these areas that I was mentioning earlier, um, part, uh, particularities, more particularities that, that in this uh, post-Roman world that seems kind of much more uh, uh, um, uh, showing a much more unified picture, if I may say. Again, disclaimer. Uh, so those are part of the boxes that are starting to, to uh, are, are, are starting, not, I'm not starting to appear, but are kind of there to start with. Then there's the diversity of evidence. Um, not all the areas that I'm working on have very clear evidence. Not all the area that I'm working on have historical or region sources. Uh, some have or may not have strong place names, evidence, uh, historical sources, archaeological remains, etc. But they might have some of these. And so there's always like gaps and, and elements missing. And also something that I have encountered, thankfully that's not too much the case, but it happens that the, the people who are very much working on an area and who are publishing a lot are really specialist in, in one area, uh, on one time period, especially. So either uh, more early medieval or early Christian or er Iron Age. And again, the, 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 there's a gap sometimes happening in certain sites. Uh, so in short, the issues with methodology uh, are kind of uh, gathering meaningful results and offering new interpretation from areas which have very different, uh, different types of evidence available. The issues with scholarship, to a certain extent, different academic tradition, different specialization, and different chronologies. Um, of course, in all the region that I showed you, of course, one of the first thing you can tell me is like, well, they're not exactly Christianized at the same time. So what are you exactly talking about? You know, Scotland, 5th, 6th century, maybe even earlier than that. Same for Ireland uh, and, and Scandinavia. Sweden, 11th, 10th, late 10th. Uh, Norway, 11th, also 10th. Um, so what exactly are you talking about? But the thing is, if we, if we kind of erase those, those uh, 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 specific elements of chronologies, but look at the wider process, uh, um, and, and the social process that goes with it, can we actually demonstrate uh, the evidence of this process rather than the specific cities? So how, how to move beyond this issue? And I'm coming back to my little boxes and thinking, well, does thinking outside of the box uh, uh, is enough? Is it enough? And so what I'm really trying to do, I get uh, think here, is to get rid of the boxes entirely and just kind of trying to throw them away. And from all these different elements, uh, yes, I know, and that's the last one, absolutely. Uh, uh, looking at, at the kind of um, universality or globality of this process, more in a kind of long, long durée rather than uh, specific, then that will be supported by comparison and comparative work. This comparison will, of course, show some connection, but also a lot of contrast, and I think that's just as meaningful as the rest. But one of the key points here is trying to really to open and broaden the conversation uh, and build bridges between uh, different elements of, of scholarship. And at the end of the day, the answer that I'm trying to provide or maybe asking more question about is really, does it matter whether the Christianization process uh, started uh, and lasted for 200, 500, 800 years? What is interesting is we start at a certain level uh, in, the, in, in different time periods, but by the 11th, 12th century, we have the first churches, we have these ecclesiastical centers, and, and so this process is, has happened. And so 
in the meantime, are we looking at the same process, not uh, linked to how long it lasted? And that's it for me. Thank you very much. Okay.